Hi, and thank you for joining me for another lecture. And friends, today's topic is very, very important. Today, friends, I'm going to show you why the religion known as Islam falls under the rubric for what is considered idolatry, Abu Dazara, according to Halakha, according to Jewish law. And I'm also going to explain why many felt that it wasn't idolatry or idolatrous, starting predominantly with the Rambam and why he and others who ruled in that manner did so. And friends, before I explain my thesis, I want to let you know that I consider myself a traditional halachic orthodox Jew and thus am basing my conclusions off the very most that we could extract from both Torah Shebiktav and Torah Shebaopet. In other words, the Chumash and Mishnaic sources. However, being that neither the Torah nor Chazal ever speak of Islam or Muslims, we will pretty much be analyzing what commentators had to say and how they tied it into our source material. So friends, first and foremost, you must understand that there exists no clear Halahi consensus on whether Islam is or is not idolatry in Jewish law. There only exists opinions, some opinions more grounded than others, but just opinions. In other words, only because, let's say, the Rambam decided that it was not idolatry, being that he was only a Rishon and not a Tana, i.e. because he did not legitimize his conclusions or his understandings with the Beit Din Hakadol, which was extinct by then, this still only remains his opinion, an opinion that again, you or your community may have chosen to embrace, but still just an opinion. However, today friends, I'm going to show you that if our opinion should sway in any direction halakhically, it sways towards Islam being an idolatrous belief system that in no way worships the Jewish God of Israel. So, to begin friends, one traditional error made on deciding whether a belief system is or is not a form of idolatry is on whether or not that belief system worships only one God. In other words, is that belief system monotheistic? So friends, yes, it is true that a polytheistic belief system cannot be considered monotheistic. However, it is also true that only because a belief system is monotheistic does not mean it is not idolatrous. However, Muslims would disagree, of course. And sometimes, Erroneously, we have allowed their interpretation of what is idolatry to decide for us. As a matter of fact, the Islamic word for idolatry is the word shirk, which is the Arabic equivalent of the Hebrew word shituf. Now, shirk and shituf mean the same thing literally. They both mean partnerships. However, according to halakha, only because a religion does not have any partnership or partnerships within its godhead does not make it non-idolatrous. For Example, Zoroastrianism is monotheistic, but it's still considered idolatry, Abu Dazara, according to Halakha. Or Arkhanatan's belief system, which is also monotheistic, and is still considered Abu Dazara al-Pi Halakha. Or when Israel was worshipping the golden calf as the one God who brought them out of Egypt. And this, we know Hazal clearly considered Abu Dazara. And you know what? The Ritva's Pasak shares the same sentiment. It states, let it be known that the faith of the Muslims, even though they unify God, is considered complete avodazara. The law is to be killed and not convert because he that admits to their faith denies the Torah of Moshe. That it is not true what we have received, what we have in our hands. And anyone who does this is similar to embracing complete Abu Dazara. And the Rambam himself makes the point in Mishneh Torah that only because one worships a singular God does not mean that one is free from the label of idolater. He states, the essence of the commandment forbidding Abu Dazara is not to serve any of the creations, not an angel, a sphere, or a star, none of the four fundamental elements, nor any entity created from them. Actually, in the same parak, he states that even denying prophecy is a form of Abu Dazara, which is the same point brought down by the Briskarav, which is actually what one would have to embrace if one embraced Islam. Now, there is a distinction that I will make in this lecture between what the Rambam codified from Chazal and his personal opinion, because the two are not always the same, which only just strengthens this lecture and really fortifies the idea that Islam is at least a form of idolatry, perhaps not the form that Halhal would consider punishable by death. Um, but really, I'm just here to show you that this idea that Islam is idolatry is not a new radical idea, but actually what most poskim held at the time of the Rambam. And the Rambam was actually considered a dat yachid, a lone voice in this argument. Even the Radbaz reiterates this reality when he's asked that when confronted with Islam, if one is obligated to give up his life or not instead of converting. 
And the Teshuvah, his answer is that I want to go into length at this because I saw the generation was breached more than it was left standing because of this leniency that they were taught regarding the matter. And then he says that Ritva's Pasak was correct, that it's better to die than to be forced to break one principle of our faith. So here, it's not clear if the Rabbaz himself is saying that Muslims themselves are idolaters, but just the embracing of another religion is akin to idolatry. So. So, friends, only because you worship one God does not mean that according to Jewish law, you're not an idolater. And this here, friends, is the biggest rut my co-religionists get stuck in. Thinking because someone worships only one God that they're in some way free from the halakhic parameters of what is considered Avodah Zarah. And friends, the biggest modern cause for this form of thinking is mainly because of the word idolatry, which conjures up images of people bowing down and worshipping statues. And yes, friends, someone who worships statues is an idolater. Actually, one of the main points is that someone who worships anything other than God, the God of Israel, is an idolater. And this is clear in Halakha. What is not clear is whether we consider the Islamic God the same Torah God? And the answer to this question is obviously not. But anyways, the word idolatry that we say in virtually every language outside of Hebrew is not the proper translation of the Hebrew phrase that means idolatry. In other words, in Hebrew, the word for idolatry is avodah zara, which literally means foreign service or foreign worship. Foreign to what? Foreign to what appears in Torah. This is crystal clear, my friends. Actually, what we call idolatry in our languages in Hebrew would be something like avodat pesilim, or the literal worshiping of statues of idols, which again would constitute a form of avodah zara, but again, only because one didn't physically worship an idol did not mean that that person was not delving into Abu Dazara. And the point of this lecture is to show that there are many other opinions and actually that probably the vast majority of opinions in the rabbinical world at that time reiterated these same points and held to these same principles. However, today people have gotten stuck just with the Pasak of the Rambam, mainly because the Shohan Aruch and the Ramah Paskin by it. Now, what does the actual Mishnah have to say about what is Abu Dazara? Well, the principal section by Chazal used to classify what falls into the rubric or category of what is Abu Dazara is in Masechet Sanhedrin. It states, he who engages in idol worship is executed. It is all one whether he serves it, sacrifices to it, offers incense, makes libations, prostrates himself, or accepts it as a god, or says to it, Thou art my god. But he who embraces it, kisses it, sweeps, or sprinkles the ground before it, washes it, anoints it, clothes it, or puts shoes on it, is still considered an idolater. He transgresses a negative precept and is not executed. He who vows or swears literally confirms a thing by its name violates a negative precept. He who uncovers himself before Baal Peor is guilty for this mode of worshipping him. He who casts a stone at Marcullus therefore worships it. Now this certainly does not mention all that is considered idolatry about that in Judaism, but it gives us a ballpark view of the issue. The question is, is whether Islam or Muslims specifically fit this mold. And if you notice that it's not one clear mode, that there is different levels of idolatry being described here by Chazal. And friends, from the outset, it seems that yes, Islam would fit this mold because remember why the Rambam wrote Egeret Hashemad in the first place, because the consensus being brought down was that Islam was a form of idolatry. And then the Rambam felt that he had to redirect that opinion. We actually see a similar situation with his letter to Ovadia Hager, telling Ovadia that what he was hearing regarding Islam by other rabbis was not true. And this, friends, is something you really need to know because the average Jew on the street will tell you that it's a closed case regarding Islam, that Judaism has always held that it's not idolatry, when they have failed to properly research the issue. And I will demonstrate through this lecture <laughs> that this notion that Islam is definitely not idolatry is very, very far from the truth. And of course, any Muslim hearing this or hearing the standards that we just brought down from Masechet Sanhedrin immediately would notice the throwing of stones, one of the ways the idols were worshipped in the pagan world, also prostrating which they do towards the Kaaba, which even Muslims would agree that what it was at least at one time practiced as a form of idolatry. Well, regarding this sugya that we just read, the Ran states that Islam here qualifies as fitting this mold of idolatry. He says that the leader of the Muslims, even though that people do not consider him a god, 
that they nevertheless bow and acknowledge that they are human incarnations of his divine will, that their halakhic status is that of idolaters or of Abu Dazara. In other words, that even though they claim that Muhammad, him and even the statues are not gods, that the simple honor which is given and demonstrated in this case by bowing, and one could even say throwing stones at it, is some sort of earthly manifestation of their God's will. Thus, this is what makes them idolaters. Also, the Meiri states in the name of Rav Yosef Megash, Muslims continue in their practice of Islamic pagans. Also, the Ibn Ezra states that the Muslims, they worship Marcolis. Remember Marcolis, the idol that the mission just states was worshipped by throwing stones at it. And the Ibn Ezra, here, he writes, and behold Marcolis, all the Arabs from east to west celebrate by throwing stones there. The men of Mecca did not turn to Muhammad's Islamic religion until he swore to them that he would not remove Marcolis worship from that location. Also regarding the same sugya, the Rama, not Moshe Ersalus, states that one who throws stones at Marcolis here in Mecca becomes guilty of idol worship. He also states that the reason Muslims rest on the sixth day is for purposes of idol worship. Now, the big question is why did the Rambam feel that Muslims were or could have been different from classical idolaters? One possibility was that he may have thought that because Muslims do not partake of wine, that they would not be menasich. They, they, in other words, would not use wine for libations that would in some way place them in a category of nochrim who were not of Dei Avodah Zorah or that of a Ger Toshav. Now this is ultimately actually a false distinction because the notion that one is allowed to derive benefit from any non-Jewish wine, apart from just being forbidden to consume it, was not mentioned or ruled upon by Chazal, but by the Geonim, which some say, like the Rashbam, that it even included Christians, that Christians were also included in this leniency, where the Rambam later forbids, in other words, the Rambam considers Christians idolaters. Now, this regarding libations is true, Muslims don't consume wine, however, it's a little hard because of the other parameters, given what we know about how Islam functions, that it still doesn't fall under the rubric of idolatry. And also, friends, one understanding regarding Muslims, at least nowadays, Muslims living in Eretz Yisrael, is that if they could possibly fall under the category of a Ger Toshav, of a resident alien. Now, this is a very popular notion because it's tied to the whole issue of the Shemitah year and Rav Cook's Chetzer Mechira. Now, this, according to Chazal and even the Rambam, is not a possibility because First of all, Al Pi a Ger Toshav that doesn't keep the commandments in the Torah is not allowed in any way to contradict them. The Rambam himself rules in this manner in Hilchot Melachim. Actually, it's also a prerequisite to even holding the status of a non-idolater, right? The prerequisite is that they have to be under Torah rule. In other words, warring in any way with Torah, the principles found within it, constitutes a form of foreign service or worship, which again, is what Avodah Zarah means. Anyways, the mission itself states that one cannot sell his land in Israel to a non-Jew. However, Rav Cook, of whom the famous Chetor is based on, understood it to mean that you cannot sell the land to an idolater, which according to him made him selling the land to Muslims okay because the Rambam classified Muslims as non-idolaters. So this is how the Halakha in practice gets invented without any Mishnahic sources to back it up. And about Muslims not just undermining our God, but putting words in his mouth and also undermining Torah itself and claiming that it's false and corrupt, one can easily say that it's kafira. Actually, api halakha, kafira is worse than idolatry, and one could even say that it could be the worst form of idolatry. Mainly because plain Amal introduces foreign concepts into Torah. However, kafira undermines the Torah itself. So, it's then a bit difficult to classify Islam, a belief system where the Rambam himself classified even their houses of prayer locations where a Jew is allowed to pray in, when a Jew would not be allowed to pray in a house of Apikorsim, of Minut, of Kafira. In other words, it's understood nowadays that Orthodox rabbis even forbid their congregants to enter Reformed synagogues because of their beliefs, but a mosque in some ways allowed. If anything, this shows that this issue has not been properly thought out. Now, what I just said really bothers some Jews nowadays, especially because Jews have adopted the practice of praying in the Merat HaMakpelah, where the Arabs have told us is where Avram Avinu was actually buried in. Mainly because it was initially a mosque where Jews just suddenly began praying in. 
And the Rambam himself regarding Kafira especially includes Muslims in this category of Kofrin. He says that there are three individuals who are considered as one who denies the Torah. They are called Kofrim. One who says that the Torah, although it came from God, the Creator replace one mitzvah with another and nullify the original Torah, like the Christians and Muslims claim. And I think the Rambam also very eloquently states this in a Teshuvah as well, where he states that it is permissible to teach commandments to Christians and draw them to our religion. So here, the Rambam is even saying that it's okay to proselytize in Judaism. That this is, although it's allowed for Christians, it's prohibited regarding Muslims, because as you know, they reject the divine origin of Torah, and if they are taught scripture, it would contradict the version of events that they have either invented or confused. Christians, on the other hand, believe the text of the Torah is immutable, although they interpret it improperly in their commentaries. If they were presented with the correct interpretation, however, it is conceivable that they would recant. And if they don't recant, it would cause us no harm since your scriptures are the same as ours. So here the Ramam clearly explains that Islam is contrary to Torah. Now, some rabbis have been able to distinguish between Muslim wine being permitted and Islam still being idolatry, like the Tzitz Eliezer, which states that although one can benefit from their wine, their mosques are still considered places of idolatry. And the truth is that it's easier, and I mean, definitely easier for us from the comfort of our own home just to call things this or that. When the Rambam himself lived at a time where Jews actually were confronted with the question on whether they should give up their lives or convert to Islam. And friends, I'm glad that I don't have to make that decision. So yes, we today could for sure sympathize with the Rambam's decision. However, the question is on whether nowadays we should continue this discussion. And friends, in my opinion, the answer is absolutely, especially with the current rise of radical Islam around the globe. And this mainly because I feel that only Torah Judaism can defeat the threat of radical Islam in our societies. Because it is only Torah Judaism that can give the Muslim a proper monotheistic alternative to their beliefs. But yes, I do believe that it was because of outside pressure that the Rambam ultimately decided the way he did. Mainly because by publicly declaring the Islamic faith as idolatrous, he would have been not only putting his own life at risk, but the lives of every one of his followers, to the point that there are even some reports that the Rambam had to convert to Islam himself on one occasion in order to save his life. Um, and even the author of Keshet Ben Magen also writes about the pressures that people back then had, even speaking their mind about issues that involved Islam. He says that regarding attacking every other notion, this existed, but regarding attacking Muslims or Arabs, he has never found someone making some sort of claim against them. And friends, another source for Islam being called idolatry is the Kuzari, where Rabbi Yehudah Halevi's rabbinic spokesman declares regarding Christian and Muslims that they praise the place of prophecy in words, but they turn in praying to places of idolatry. They retain the relics of ancient worship and feast days, changing nothing but this, that they have demolished the idols without doing away with the rites connected with them. It states, you will serve wooden stones Stone, and this alludes to the worship of wood, i.e. the Christians, and the stone, Muslims, which we incline daily more and more because of our sins. And the Taj Beits here, in this portion of the Kuzari states, that the wood is the wood of Christianity, the wood of Jesus, of the cross, and the stone is a stone that is thrown in the Islamic festival in Mecca. And friends, the truth is that Muhammad, as a youth, participated in worshipping the 360 pagan gods in the Kaaba, in Mecca, owned and operated by the Koresh tribe to which Muhammad was a member of. And as Muhammad grew older, he was influenced by Christians who condemned the polytheism that was found at the Kaaba. And some point in Muhammad's life, we see that he was convinced by the Christians that polytheism was wrong and sought to reject the pagan gods he grew up with. However, Although Muhammad became a monotheist, he was a very proud, or he was very proud of his Arab culture. So, in an attempt to preserve his traditions, Muhammad decided to reform his native pagan religion rather than to adopt a completely different religion. So, what did he do? Well, he took the top pagan god of the Kaaba and Mecca, called Allah, and chose it to be his new monotheistic god. No, that. This god was already considered the top god 
among the other gods at the Kaaba. So his strategy was simple. Rather than converting all the Arab peoples to monotheism or the monotheism of Christianity, Muhammad merely banished the other 359 pagan gods and chose one remaining to be the one the one only true God, the Islamic God, what Muslims refer today as Allah. And thus, Islam was born, my friends. Now, I know that it's true that Allah is the same Hebrew word that we pronounce today for Eloah. However, this in no way makes the case for it being the same God that we worship. Actually, the word El literally just means God in Hebrew, right? Not specifically the God of Israel. Actually, El or Elim could also refer to foreign gods or idols. So. The word El predated the Torah's use, to the point that the Canaanites also had a god named El. And I think this inconsistency grows even more and more today when Jews stupidly claim that the god of the Christians is a foreign god, but the Muslims, we worship the same god as they do. Now, I'm not arguing for the traditional Christian view of God, but what I'm going to tell you is that one easy way to determine on whether or not we worship the same god is to first ask the question on what does that God or where or what does the God in question demand from us? If it demands the same, then it could very well be the same God. However, as you already know, that by eliminating the vast majority of our laws, claiming that our source texts are corrupted, replacing our holy sites, and using a completely different prayer liturgy and fueling the most violent form of religious extremism this world has ever seen. <laughs> Yes, we worship different gods, my friends. Even the Rambam himself admitted to the fact that even according to his opinions, Muslims were not far from idolatry. He writes, And these Muslims are not distant from idolatry, and the ultimate purpose in that all the Geonim were lenient regarding benefiting from their wine and more so. But regarding the permission to drink wine they touched, we have not heard from any posek. And like we said before, that because of this ruling, the Rambam may have thought that this meant that they were not idolaters. However, as per the Rashbam, Rashi holds its way that this leniency of the Geonim also included Christians. Now, there is a form of Islam that everyone agrees is Abu Dazara, and that is Sufism, the belief system of the Sufis, which is a mystical form of Islam. And about these, the Rambam's son directly calls it idolatry. We even have Rav Yosef Karo calling it idolatry. So, what's the final understanding? Look, this whole understanding on whether Islam is idolatry first came up because of the decision made by the Geonim not to usher their wine bahana, to allow us to at least benefit from wine that we were in no way allowed to consume. And this surprisingly also includes included the wine of Christians as per Rashi. The reason given by the Geonim was that there is a difference between idolaters post-Chazal than the idolaters pre-Chazal. This is clear. So I think given all the back and forth, we could say that any religion that either competes with or tries to supersede Torah Judaism is literally a form of Abu Dazara, whether they worship one or many gods. However, in the same understanding of the Geonim, there's a huge gulf between the practitioners of these religions today and those back then, which in no way would make them liable for their worship, which is really done out of ignorance, and even the Rambam acknowledged that it's really done out of ignorance. They don't know exactly what they're doing. So it's understandable that the Creator would excuse their ignorance, but Halakha does not have to compromise on their status around us for the sake of Jews and ultimately Torah. This is why, even though someone who accepts to keep the seven laws or some lesser standard of the 613 mitzvot, it would also be forbidden for that person to in any way challenge the Torah by creating or codifying some sort of belief system for themselves or others that acts as some sort of alternative to Torah. Which is why I'm always boggled why a rabbi would offer a person who comes to convert to Judaism the chance to become a Noahide. In other words, that person was already a Noahide, so by placing him now in some sort of group, he would be creating a system for him which would get him to violate the halakha, right? Because the halakha is that he's not allowed to create a religion for himself. He either remains what he is or he converts to Judaism, right? This is brought down clearly in the Rambam. Why? Again, because Torah Judaism is not supposed to create for itself or tolerate competitors, which is what happens when someone is going to call a foreign belief system like Islam pure monotheism and non-idolatrous. So Islam is 100% Abu Dazara. However, we should sympathize with its followers and under halakha, not hold them liable for deliberate Abu Dazara. So how can they cease to be idolatrous? First, they would have to acknowledge our scriptures fully as authentic without any rewording. They would also have to eliminate their practices that are associated with 
ancient idolatry that are performed typically during the Hajj, the tossing of stones, the kissing of the black stone, the bowing towards the Kaaba, or any pagan practice that has crept into the religion. Because honestly, it, the act of accepting Muhammad as a prophet in itself does not constitute idolatry, or in my opinion is in any way theologically problematic in itself. Now what may come from it is another issue. In, in other words, I agree that philosophically there is a problem, but theologically I don't really see an issue with this. However friends, if you are really, really interested in a more meaningful relationship with our Creator, I want to welcome you. I want to welcome everyone hearing my voice today to consider Torah Judaism because you, every one of you listening by converting to the Jewish religion can become a full member of the people of Israel and as well become an inheritor to every blessing in our God's Torah. In other words, the only difference between a Jew and someone who's not Jewish or a member of Israel and someone who's not a member of Israel is that the Israelite, the Jew, has chosen to follow HaKodesh Baruch Hu, has chosen to accept Torah for himself. Friends, for more information about everything Jewish, please visit TorahJudaism.org. Thank you.